TG Geeks, Episode 117, May 8, 2017. What do opera and a haunted hotel in Arizona have in common? Hello and welcome to another webcast from TGGeeks.com where Ben and Keith, the two gay geeks, talk about all aspects of geekdom and nerdery. Sci-fi, comics, film, horror, genre, opera, you name it, we talk about it. I saw what you just did there. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm Keith Lane and we're coming to you from TG Squared Studios in lovely, cool for today, since it was 108 on Friday and it's 72 today, 24. as we're recording phoenix arizona and i'm ben raginton also coming to you from now i feel refreshed phoenix arizona yeah and this time we've got a a really cool interview with clint borzoni and john de los santos they were the composer and librettist for uh copper queen and it's uh we'll we'll just launch on that interview because they kind of tell us what it's all about so let's get right to it This time we have a treat for you. We have the composer and the librettist for the new opera Copper Queen. We have John uh, Clint Borzoni and John De Los Santos. Clint is the composer and John is the librettist and he was also acting as stage director for the workshop performance here at Arizona Opera. So welcome to the show Clint and John. Thank you for having Thank you. us. It's great to be here. Okay, so Copper Queen, this was uh, a a piece that was done that you did as part of a workshop and as part of a competition. So who wants to give us a little background on how that came about and what what you did to to prepare for Copper Queen and what kind of what it's about? Um, I'll start off with the how we got started and then John can get into, I guess, how he discovered the story. So Arizona Opera had an open call um, competition for opera ideas called Arizona Spark. And uh, a few of my friends sent it to me saying, oh, this sounds great. And John and I wrote a piece already uh, called One Adonis Calls. And we were looking for another project to work together on. And then I literally uh, contacted John the day before the deadline for Arizona Spark, and then? Um, well, I was like, so, Clint, I've got, like, 24 hours to do this. He goes, yep, yep, have fun. <laughs> I, oh, no pressure. To, no pressure at all, no. But I'm from, I'm from Texas, which a lot of people think, oh, well, that's part of the South, but obviously Arizona is a very, very different region. Absolutely. Um, and culture. And so I literally Googled weird stuff in Arizona, and after about six pages of UFOs, I came across this haunted hotel in Bisbee, Arizona, um, the Copper Queen, which is over 100 years old. It's the oldest working hotel, I think. I know it is in Arizona. It might be in the country, too. It's been a while since I've looked it up. But apparently it's one of the most notoriously haunted, and one of them is haunted by the ghost of a woman named Julia Lowell who killed herself in her room when she was spurned by one of her clients. And I read through real quick, and I called Clint and said, hey, do you want to do a story about a real ghost of a dead hooker? And he said, sure, <laughs> that sounds great. Let's now, now, now let's, let's be a little more circumspect here. We'll call her a cowtown courtesan. How's oh, that? Oh, wow. <laughs> you know I'm funny? impressed <laughs> that you <laughs> pulled that out. I have a thesaurus of Old West um, slang and dirty sexual terms and everything, <laughs> and the number of terms for prostitute, there were like three pages. Oh, my God. So we had lots to choose from. We started with Lady of the Evening because we thought that sounded, oh, that sounds very operatic, but we've actually gone with Soiled Dove. Oh, Soiled Dove. Oh, my <laughs> word. Oh my I'm not God. sure that's nice. <laughs> that doesn't, that doesn't yeah. sound too good. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so this is uh, the Copper Queen is a hotel, and you guys actually did some research on this. Is that correct? 
We did. We actually um, wrote the first half of the opera and did the first workshop. And then when the second one was made available to us, I called Clint and I said, Clint, we need to go. And Clint, you want to tell him what happened from there? Yeah, and I was like, oh, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, just because just... it's, it's actually pretty far from Arizona Opera. It was like a three hour drive right, or whatnot. Yeah. And you guys are, then, are both live in the New York City area, so it was quite a haul, a haul to come right? come to Arizona and then drive three hours <laughs> yeah. to go to this hotel. <laughs> and Clint doesn't drive. Yeah, <laughs> we were actually just talking about that. <laughs> so, but then, was, but then the funny thing is that John, the hotel apparently that room is booked up like nonstop, and it was like a month before the workshop, and John called and was like, "Oh, you know, I want this room for the suite for Julie Lowell." And the lady was like, oh, it's always booked, but when do you want to come? And we could only literally do it on a Saturday or one day, and it was that was the only day that the room was free and available. Oh, wow. So oh, that, was, freaky. that was fortuitous. Okay. That was a little Twilight zone <laughs> Yeah, I have a – do I have a – I've got the Twilight Zone sound. Where is it? Where is it? Oh, is now it? you lost it. <laughs> yeah. There we go. <laughs> We, we should tell you about the, our experience in that room. Yeah, please that do. Please, please tell us about that, and oh, then we'll talk about how you wrote this and, and how you came about the libretto, etc. So tell us the story of the Copper Queen and, and your evening with the Lady well, of the Evening. <laughs> first of all, to get to Bisbee, you have to drive through Tombstone, literally. And mm. you drive like through this great big canyon and we were like oh my god there's nothing here and then you come over the the ridge and there's this very very artsy beautiful fun quirky city that's just nestled there and the copper queen is kind of the center of the whole town and it's full of um former hippies and bikers and artists and all kinds of clairvoyance and really interesting folks so you know we we checked in and the hotel is exactly like what we describe. It's a very old fashioned. It has a um, oh a switchboard, and a big safe in the front and all of that. So uh, we you know checked in and went into the room. We were both really really nervous and sure enough, it's velvety and red and very slutty. In fact, there's a peacock headboard, so we know that she uh, she made her coins. Uh -huh. Oh, I'm far out. <laughs> Yeah, and the whole the whole, there is there is with I'm not a huge believer in a lot of paranormal stuff. I mean, I'm not gonna say it doesn't exist, but I was skeptical. But there's an energy in that room. It's heavy. Really? Wow. Definitely very heavy. Yes. So I, I did read that um, that most men don't have uh, real experiences other than a scent of perfume, but but women have a tendency to to really experience uh, different things in that room. And, and I'm just wondering, you guys had an experience and just... Because yeah, we're basically half women, the two of us. So it actually, I, I think she could sense that. And, um, you know, we, nothing really happened during the day. But at night, that's when things kind of went crazy. Clint, you want to go first? <laughs> um, yeah, the, the weird thing is, I mean, the hotel is 90 percent how it was they've only updated you know i guess coming I mean, or whatnot so everything is basically the same and when you go in there it smells very like an antique shop oh wow and the funny thing is when we uh first you know we, we saw the room 315 and we wrote this opera and you know we say room 315 all throughout the opera and we're standing there looking at this plaque in her room we kind of looked at each other like wow we're here and we when we went and we were, you know, very trepidatious to walk into the room, and once we were in the room, we didn't close the door. I don't know. It was weird, right, John? Like, we didn't want to close yeah. it. We didn't want to be in there in that room. Right. Uh, so we we found out that she likes to do most of her taunting in the bed, like, while you're sleeping. Uh -huh. So, of course, John gives me the bed so I could get taunted the most. <laughs> and he slept... <laughs> And he slept um, on the floor by the bathroom, which I felt a worse energy in the bathroom. I um, I believe in, I guess I believe more in spooks and ghosts and energies than John does. So I like brought my crystal. <laughs> I brought like all this like protective stuff. Yeah. Um, and the the weird thing is, while we're, while I was sleeping in the room, I 
I had a dream where I felt her t- at my leg, oh, like wow. literally grabbing my leg and trying to bring me out of the room. And I was like, I guess I was dreaming and I was screaming for John to help me. I was oh, like, help this, li- this, like, I'm getting thrown out of the room. And then I had another dream where the same exact thing happened. Wow. And when I woke up, my leg, and I was wearing, like, pants and a sweatshirt, my leg in that one place where she grabbed me was ice cold. Wow. And I was under those covers, and it was, like, that feeling when you're under the covers, like, when you're a little kid, and you don't want to, you know, come from under them because you know there's a monster, like, standing right in front of you. Right. Uh-huh. That that's exactly what I felt like. I did not want to move. I was like frozen, like a deer. Oh my gosh! And then and then um oh and then another funny thing that happened was we went to dinner, and the way the room opens, there's this dresser, and the door opens of the dresser, and the door is open. It is opened into the door that you. So we, everything was closed, and when we came into the room. The door was open, oh so gosh. it looked like there was something right in front of us when we walked in, and we both screamed. Oh, my. <laughs> what? <laughs> what was that? And it was yeah. just the, yeah. the bureau opened, I guess, by itself while wow. we weren't in there. Hmm. So that was mm-hmm. Fascinating. Yeah. So, John? And then John, and I, happened? Oh, I, had, I had fun on the floor, let me tell you. So... <laughs> um, I went to bed in a very good mood because I had explored the hotel. And incidentally, the, four, the, the Julia's room is on the third floor, but the fourth floor is apparently the most haunted. So I went and explored um, by myself because Clint wanted to stay in bed and watch American Dad. And, um, <laughs> is that I actually just, family? <laughs> fam- family guy, excuse me. <laughs> but I'm walking around, and the fourth floor literally feels ominous. There's a really, really dark, heavy energy there that's really not welcoming at all. Wow. But, you know, Clint and I, we went to sleep at about the same time and everything was fine. Um, I, at about 4 a.m., bolted up and I have never had a night terror in my life. But I bolted up and I had the most insane, unbelievable rage in me. I mean, Clint is one of my most favorite collaborators and I wanted to kill him. Oh, my. And I... (laughs) <laughs> and it was crazy because I felt this really huge weight on my chest, and I woke up, and it took me a minute to kind of get control of myself before I just calmed down, and I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. I just sat there just really, really trepidatious and feeling this real sense of paranoia because I've never – my entire like psyche was just invaded with this horrible, horrible anger and, and, and rage, and wow. it, it, I've never experienced that before, and – so the next morning, we were both exhausted because of the time change and just a long night. And we went to brunch, and we mentioned to our waitress, she goes, are you guys from here? And we said, no, we're from New York. And we told her why. And she said, oh, yeah, I wasn't going to say anything, but I'm actually a clairvoyant. And I noticed there's some kind of a strange energy around the two of you. And we're like having our migas and French toast. And we're like, <laughs> tell us more. And she essentially said that um, she felt that Julia – wanted the two of us to experience these two, these two different sides of her um, experience in that room. So she gave me the rage, of course, because I was on the floor and, you know, the bitchy one. And she gave Clint the feeling of, you know, helplessness and isolation and coldness wow. in the whole thing. We you know, she amazing. kind of amazing. That... I mean, she wasn't even our waitress. She was like somebody else. She actually just came over to us because she said she felt – an energy around us or that we had an experience that she wanted to wow. you know find out more about that's all right she said that our experience with this opera you know we're by getting julia's story out there and trying to find a way to you know make things right we could actually help lease her spirit or something like no, that. So i was just about to ask that is this maybe uh i mean unintended uh on your parts i mean would this actually serve as some means of uh, finally finally letting her spirit rest? Sounds like it will. It certainly could be, yeah. Right. I mean, that's a question in the opera because the the ending is very um, kind of ambiguous about whether or not the spirit has been released or not. Because right. our hope – I mean, I personally love old historic buildings, and I hate to see them, you know – torn down to put up another set of uh, ugly condos. Agreed. Right. And yep. so anything that we can do to bring tourism to Bisbee and the Copper Queen and keep that legacy going is fascinating to me. I think very important to 
you know, American culture. And I think that the hotel is a very, very wonderful example of that. So hopefully that this, the opera will not only bring great music, but also make people aware of this place and, uh, you know, make people want to visit. Yeah. That, there's, so that's, that's a great transition because we, we didn't get to listen to the whole opera. I mean, or because you know, Clint, you sent both pieces and we've, Mm -hmm. kind of shuffled through it and listened to a, a good portion of it but it was it was the, the the way you wrote the music it seemed like there was there was some very lyrical parts and then there was this frenetic uh pieces and and I was just wondering if that that was kind of the the two sides of Julia if you will and and what was going on in her life and the craziness and then the lyrical uh pieces that you wrote together uh, yeah, how did and, you approach? Right, and uh, also, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this opera takes place in two different times. Mm -hmm. So uh, did that play a part also into how you wrote the music? Right. So oh, my, Definitely. Um, did you guys ever see the movie uh, District 9? Yes. All right, so the premise of District 9 is it opens as a documentary, right. and it's shot as a documentary. And then the movie transitions to just a regular movie. Mm -hmm. So with this uh, opera, it's there's two very distinct time periods. 1910, Julia's time, and there's 2010, um, basically our time or whatnot. So we open with very creepy, you know, contemporary sounding music just to set the mood that right. we're in 1910. And... And after the first scene, which takes place, you know, I'm sorry, 2010. Um, so after we set that transition up to the next scene, which is in 1910, I use a lot of ragtime music yeah. and kind of uh -huh. harmonies from that era. And then I kind of go back and forth with this. And then I, and then eventually I just kind of let the emotions of each dramatic scene take over. Right. So it's no longer... Okay, we're in 1910. Here's a little ragtime to let you know. Well, we're in 2010. Here's a little dissonance to let you know. So the lyricism comes in, you know, when they're in love or when Julia is feeling very passionate about something. Right. Or the other character, Addison Moore, is feeling passionate about something. And basically the frenetic music is Julia, like, the, she can't breathe and she feels overwhelmed and suffocated, you know, by her life. Right. And she's basically having a little nervous breakdown yeah. <laughs> in the middle of the opera. Yeah, I, I wondered if that was the case because it was the the juxtaposition yeah. of the music was very interesting. Of, it was such a dichotomy it, yeah, in, in you, composition you style. Have this lyrical mm -hmm. thing going on, and then all of a sudden there's this you know dissonance that happens, and it, it just it it was kind of it, it wasn't jarring, but it was like oh. Maybe this is, you know, and I I just wondered if that was kind of where you were going with that is uh, mm -hmm. her the different pieces of her life and parts of her life of, you know, she happy at some point and then all of a sudden this craziness involves it comes into her life and and, you know, well, that, there's also the idea of, you know, the essence that a spirit embodies of a person is different from the living, breathing individual and correct we right. always talked about how in the, that that's part of the reason why i came up with the idea of splitting it because i thought that if we just do a story if we just do julia's story it's you know butterfly traviata we've seen it many times right but if we have a contemporary character who's experiencing it through a 20 a, a woman's 21st century gaze and experience then that gives us something to comment on and experience as a contemporary audience and to split up the music so right Julia's essence sounds very different than it does when she's alive. Right. Uh, but Clint mm -hmm. has found many ways of weaving those two parts of her together through the aria and other moments in there. So we feel like we've created two very three-dimensional characters yeah. in, um, in the piece. Absolutely. I, yeah. I, I, I thought it was, it was a lot fascinating. of fun right. Yeah. What are some of the challenges that you had to face in terms of uh, in terms of, of writing the, this, this music, you know, because uh, contemporary operas these days uh, can tend to be off-putting. 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, we've heard we've heard some 20th century operas that uh, kind of walked out thinking, well, that was not the most memorable thing we've ever heard. Or, you know, I'm not, I, I can't exactly whistle any tunes as I walk into the car. <laughs> you know, so uh, when trying to write an opera today, especially with Copper Queen, uh, what were mm-hmm. some of the challenges that 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 did, did you have any preconceived ideas as to how you wanted to approach the music? I mean, you did say, obviously, you know, you wanted to introduce some 1910 kind of melodies and harmonies. Uh, but just looking at the opera as a whole, and, and, and with other operas that you work on, uh, do, you, do you find any kind of challenges at trying to create something that uh, will, will bring the audience in as, a, as opposed to like um, uh, pushing them away? And I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Um, one of the worst operas Keith and I ever saw was Lizzie Borden. <laughs> I mean, oh. I utterly, utterly hated that. Hated it. I know a lot of people it. in that and who wrote it, so I'm not going to say anything. What's, hey. you, you what? I know a lot of people who are in that, and so I'm not going to say anything. Uh. <laughs> I couldn't stand it. Uh, I'm can, gonna, I say, I, can I actually, can I comment on that? Because let me tell you, I saw Lizzie Borden too. And this is, I think, what sets Copper Queen apart from a lot of operas about subjects like that. I feel if you're going to do something like Lizzie Borden or anything, you have to have a little bit of a sense of humor about it because I feel like that you can obviously tell it with respect and with deference and whatever, but I think you have to recognize you're writing an opera about a nursery rhyme about a woman killing her parents. Right. Yeah. You know, there's there's an element of not so much maybe camp, but there's an element of, you know, over the top qualities, kind of like in a lot of old movies. Right. And I think that Clint and I found ways to supplement this very heartbreaking story of this trapped woman and the terror and the horrible things she goes through with moments of lightness, even right. if it's dark humor. Oh, yeah. I really think that when you're telling something horrible, you have to have light and humor to balance it out. Otherwise, it's just a drag. Right. And that's what I feel like the problem with Lizzie Borden and some of these other operas are. They treat their subjects so seriously. <laughs> and at the end of the day, you've got people singing big notes. Right. You know, we, about these well, to well, to quote something to from Amadeus is it's we it, it's so the subject matter is so lofty that they shit marble. You know. Oh dear. <laughs> <I> mean, <you laughs> know. <laughs> it's like, come on, let let's not be so serious. What, let's you, you treat just it hit with something that yeah. You just hit on something that I hadn't even really thought of, and and I'm I'm glad you mentioned this. Is it because a lot of composers are approaching these operas with such seriousness? I mean. A twelve tone is very popular these days. Now, Keith and I were old farts. You know, I, mm-hmm. I it's just not exactly in my wheelhouse. I know that there are a lot of uh, a lot of people today. I think some of the intelligentsia. I mean, they they really just you know the intellectuals are just they just gobble up twelve tone. Uh, I I can't speak for the mainstream opera going audience because uh, I don't know what what they're into. I know I only know what I like, and I have a you know very good <laughs> idea what Keith likes. But when composers, you know, 20th century composers, when they're approaching matters that, that are, like, really serious, I mean, is, is it like uh, a beckoning call to write something in 12 tone? Or, you know, because you just said, you know, you approach Copper Queen with a certain likeness. Does that kind of, like, give you liberty to write something that's got a little bit more lyricism to it? Um, my style in general is extremely romantic and musical theatery and um, more emotional. So the challenge for me was writing the dissonant music or the scary music and the intense, um, not-so-pretty music that is in the Copper Queen. But in this case, it's not about, you know, being, ooh, I could write 12-tone or difficult music. It was about that kind of music serves the purpose dramatically. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Of being scary or being intense. But what drew me, when John gave me this idea about the Copper Queen, what I was most, I was very excited and I was pretty scared of two things. I was very excited to write a strong or two strong female characters, two female leads, which a lot of my other operas were basically male leads up until that point. And, except my first one wasn't. Um, and with and there was also a love duet between a tenor and a soprano. No yes. one else dying to write a love duet with a big old fat tune in there. Right, <laughs> right. Like a big love theme that comes back in a million different guises throughout the opera. And it means different things every time it comes. And what scared me was that I had to create intense music, scary music, 
And like I always do with John, I said, send me some music that you think is scary so I could, you know, kind of figure out what people think scary music sounds like. Because <laughs> I love horror movies. So right, right. It was a no-brainer for me. Right. So are you guys going to come for Hercules versus the Vampires? I want to. I'm trying to figure out my schedule because I think it's a fabulous idea. And I would. I, I think that, you know, what I love about that is there might be a lot of non-opera um, or classical music fans who come and see that for the horror element. That's what we're hoping. Hopefully, yep. Yeah, those kind of folks who say, oh, maybe they're going to do this ghost opera about this real hotel. We should go check that out, too. Well, yeah, that, well that's yeah. one of the reasons why we wanted to talk about this. And it's one of the things that I, you know, I, I think, Clint, you said you, you listened to our interview that we had with uh, Joe. Alec mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Daniela. D Daniela, and you know, that opera really is a lot geekier than uh -huh. I think a lot of people are willing to admit. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you know, Hercules versus the Vampires is a clear example of that. I think Copper Queen is another one that could really be a great example of that. Absolutely. Too. I mean, you know, if, if you're really into supernatural, if you're into horror or whatever, um, or, or or even something that that could be uh, what I would what I would dub as southwestern gothic. Yeah, uh, I mean, <laughs> I mean, that, I love that. That. isn't that? Oh, you can take it. Hey, We're you can use that. that. Southwestern We're Gothic. That. Use it. <laughs> I just made that up right now. I'm glad you liked it. Um, but copyright, copyright, copyright. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can mail your check to Ben at TG Geeks now. Um, yeah, but the uh, of RuPaul, consider that stolen. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, it it just goes to show that uh, opera there's there is so much more to uh, to offer when when it comes to uh, the the you know the world of opera there's just so much there oh yeah and I, and I think Copper Queen is an excellent example of that and I do I do want to say you know Clint you were talking about the the the, the duet between the, mm -hmm. the tenor and, and the soprano and uh, got to hear that today and um, mm -hmm. as soon as it ended I turned to Keith and I said I liked it yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was really it was quite lovely. It was just quite lovely, yeah. Thank it was you. quite lovely. I I was very very pleased with that. About that duet is it's funny that the theme of da 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 ba, da 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 mm -hmm. that is the only piece in the entire opera that Clint composed before the words were written. Wow. Because we we wrote the whole first act, and while we were in Arizona, Clint said we were, literally the day before we left, he said. Hey, what do you think of this little this this little melody? And he played it for me, and he said, "I think that's going to be the love theme." So think about think about that. And I wrote the words um, to it on the plane on the way back to New York because wow. it was just it hit me right away. So uh, that's that's interesting. Let me ask about that. Um, so Clint, you like to write? You like you prefer to have the libretto first and then try to write the melody around that? Yes, yeah, so that's how I use. That's how I think. That's how John and I have always. Uh, worked. Um, I get the libretto first, and then I mean I have like harmonic themes in my head, or maybe just general basic melodic or harm structures, so I could leave room for the words or whatnot. But in this case, we had the first workshop at Arizona Opera, and um, w there's a little bit of a lovey duet, you know, um, in the first act. The, 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 you, you don't have the full blown you know, declaration of love until the second act. And I kind of was inspired by, you know, um, seeing, you know, Sarah, you know, singing with the tenor. And I was, you know, in the Arizona Opera practice room or whatnot, and I came up with the idea. And I told John, I said, John, come in here. And he recorded it on his um, phone. I said, this is going to be their love duet, so I need, I'm not going to change it because <laughs> it's, I like it just the way it is. So we, I need words that fit this. Mm -hmm. And usually I'm not like that. Usually, you know, the words yes, come you are. first. <laughs> <laughs> Don't change anything. <laughs> but I yeah, 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 but actually, it, was, it was cool. It was kind of a mutual inspiration because when I sent him the first couple of scenes, I didn't know what he was going to think because the last opera we did together was all constructed from poetry of another author. So this is the first time he would be composing to my words and it just instantly he took to it and went for it, especially with the aria. And so it was kind of fun to take one of Clint's melodies and then, you know, create, craft a, a phrase about love into that. So it was a nice uh, change of pace. Wow. So it was a, a, a change in your collaboration. And you guys have collaborated on a number of pieces, uh, correct? This is our second piece together, yeah. Oh, okay. I thought you had done a couple more. So I, I have to ask John. Oh, go ahead. 
That's like two full length operas. That's like what? Are we, that's like three and a half hours of collaboration so far within a short time, right? We've only been working together like how many years? Like four or five? Three? Three? No, not wow. five. Maybe I think three. Three, three years. Wow. Three or four years, something like that. Wow. Three very full years. So no, I, like four I, years. I, I have to four ask. Years. I have to ask John this question, and the, the reason I, I wanted to ask you about this is, you know, whenever you go and see, you know, a classic opera today, you know, you hear, you know, a Bohème or a Traviata, you know, it, you always hear Puccini, Verdi, you know. The, the thing is, though, is that they wrote the music, they didn't write the libretto, you know, and I kind of get the feeling that sometimes the librettist is kind of getting a little shortchanged here because mm -hmm. you, you, you're just not singing, uh, you know, la, 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 la. I mean, you're singing words. Right. So, John, right. when, when you're writing a, a libretto, uh, what, what's kind of your approach and, you know, what kind of a writing style and meter are you using? Uh, I mean, is, is, you know, obviously, you're, writing in, you're trying to write in some kind of rhyme or you know, some kind of prose or something when you write out a libretto. I mean, what's, what's going in your mind and what kind of structure are you taking that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because this is something that a lot of composers love to talk about, how, you know, opera... The music is first and the libretto is always second and you know the libretto is a thankless job and i completely disagree with the latter half i do believe that the music is the first thing that must come but the way that i've um come to believe that the, the, the collaboration and the end product is i liken it to a fire music is fire it gives warmth you it gives light it gives uh energy and all of these wonderful things and you must have it to live mm -hmm. but a fire will only survive if it has good strong kindling and i feel like a libretto is the kindling the music is the fire well i i i, I just I, I mean i agree i agree completely I, I'm just saying that, you know, historically now, especially, you know, you go you, you go into uh, any opera hall, you know, and they've got advertisements for operas, you know, and they always, you, you'll see the, co the composer's name in big print, and you might be lucky if you see the librettist's name in little tiny print. And, and that's why I really wanted to give this kind of bit of a spotlight to you, because, and, and you're right. It's these are songs. I mean, I'm, I'm using a very basic term by saying that. But it's the words are just as vital, in my opinion, and because they not only well, it not only gives uh, the composer something to work with, but it it helps to drive the narrative at the same time. Absolutely. Well, it's like this. It's like the story of when um, the writers of Showboat were at a party, and the wife and, and this guest said to one of, said to the composer's wife, "Oh, I just love that your husband wrote Old Man River. I love that song." And Mrs. Hammerstein, the book writer, said, "Excuse me. Her husband wrote. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh -huh. My husband wrote Old Man River. Right. You know, <laughs> they work to they work in tandem together. You know, and I think that, you know, in this day and age, the librettos are vitally, you know, equally important in many ways because people expect it. People do not expect, especially in English." People don't expect to go to see something where the same phrase is repeated eight times and expresses, you know, a very uh, overblown sentiment without any kind of subtlety or dramatic uh, intent in the writing. And so, but no, the composer is always going to be first in opera. And but again, that's why I love it. I love. I could never do what Clint does, and what he does inspires me to do better work. Mm -hmm. So. I don't feel shortchanged or like the underling at all because I know without me he wouldn't have written Copper Queen. So <laughs> right, well, and you you write the words and and his music gives life to the words and it sure. inspires you and the music that he comes up with inspires you to write more words and it it just it it's real a real collaboration. So uh, uh, and uh, John, you just touched uh, also on something you know how you might because I've I've seen this a lot especially. Um, in a, in bel canto opera uh how uh who the librettist or the composer i'm not sure who does it but they'll take a phrase and repeat it like six times you know and the only reason you reckon i mean i don't speak italian but the only reason i recognize is because i've i've listened to it enough times i'm like oh yeah i reckon oh there it is again there it is again boom 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 you know six times in a row there it is for whatever reason um so uh, I suppose for American audiences today, I mean, I don't know what the sentiment was at the time Rossini would, you know, would have written something like that. 
but you know today audiences don't mind is that um that clearly that's not something you necessarily want to do when writing an opera in in, in the english language um it, it's kind of goes both ways because of course obviously today super titles are the norm you're going to have titles right and a lot of times the repetition is not just because oh i couldn't think of anything else a lot of it is because you know you all i think that the most important rule that a librettist needs to live by is whatever you write must give the music room to breathe mm -hmm. and if you have if you have a sentiment that you are expressing in three sentences you should try to express it in one sentence because that way the compo the music fills in the rest of the blanks because mm. i think that the whole the whole point of opera to me is to tell stories in a way that words cannot express express emotion that words cannot express and mm -hmm. so that's why the librettist's job is to give uh, an opportunity and an idea is presented with the words but then the music takes over and expands on it in a way that no matter what language you speak, you listen to it, you get what's going on. So, Clint, so, okay, and f well, you know, you, that's okay. I will. I now consider myself very enlightened in that respect. And and I, <laughs> so, uh, Clint, have you ever taken like say, you know, John's libretto or, or someone else's libretto and uh, restructured it a little bit because of where the music was kind of being taken as you were composing it? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, and to go back what you said before about the librettist, I think if you watch a movie and the movie stinks, but the music is really great, it's a great score, the movie stinks. No one goes, oh, that movie got so much better because the music was so good, right? Like you'll say, oh, that was a good score, but the end wasn't good. So I think the same thing about opera. You don't have a good story that's paced correctly, and that's all the librettists. They, like, set up all the plot, all the structure, and the composer just has to kind of follow that and keep it moving. So good music doesn't save the bad libretto and vice versa. Mm, you true. Know, we both have to be on the same page. True. But what I saying before about if I feel that my music is going in a certain direction, I kind of, you know, John and I talk really time and we'll be like on Facebook I'm like John I'm writing this right now I need more words I need less words to fit my phrases and um, sometimes I have to say send me what you want to do musically and I'll match it up or does this work or I'll ask him can I just change there to they are you know like I need an extra syllable or I need uh, or I'll say, give me another word with four syllables instead of three. Mm. Oh, that's so, cool. Yeah. And whenever yeah, he know. does that on Facebook, I log off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's interesting. Very you know, collaborative. I, I I thought I was wondering about that. If that was uh, how you kind of worked things around, is you came up with words, and then all of a sudden the the composer has a phrase that he wants to say and says, can I change these words or can you give me a different word? That's or, something that I've always yeah. wondered about opera and uh, now I finally have had the opportunity to ask. But so, but I, I love the idea of it being so collaborative between the two of you. I mean, I can't imagine that oh, a lot yeah, of... we love it. I mean, I don't know how the many operas have been that way. The trust each other so implicitly that anytime he has... A, he's had crazy ideas that have not worked and he said, Billion Ideas that have worked amazingly well and so have I. We are both very, very eager to try each other's crazy ideas because some of the craziest ones have yielded the best results in our work. Mm -hmm. oh, and wow. neither one of us is right all the time. So it, it's a That's wonderful, true. trusting, very, very uh, easygoing and open relationship. So I'm very, very, very happy that it's worked out. Wow, that is, that's incredible. So have you got plans for collaborating on something new? Or are you in currently collaborating on something new? What, what are you both doing right now? Let me, let's ask that question. Right now we're, we're trying to get a premiere of either When Adonis Calls or Copper Queen. That's our first priority because uh -huh. we've worked oh, for I, three that, years kind of nonstop. Yeah, that reminds me. Uh, we, we were talking about this when we were listening to the music that there are some sections of the music that really lend themselves to just being uh, piano 
what kind of orchestration do you... Uh, who will be doing the arrangement? Yeah. What, what, um, what? That would be me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so when you, so when you um, compose this music, even though you're originally uh, playing it on the piano, you've got m you mm. already have it in your mind. Okay, this is going to be like the cellos playing this uh, 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 kind of thing, or, or maybe a low brass or something like that. You've already got that kind of in your head? I mean, I, 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 every opera I've written has been different. The opera John and I wrote last was um, One of Donna's Calls, and it's for string quartet and percussion. So I wrote that opera with string quartet and percussion first. Like, I wrote how it was going to be right away, because um, it's a small ensemble. Um, for the Copper Queen, I knew that we were going to have piano workshops. Okay. So uh, what I did was some things are very pianistic, which I'm going to have to completely orchestrate because, uh. you know, you do certain things on the piano to keep the sound going, to right. keep that volume up, like runs and arpeggios. Right. But if you have a string, strings, they could just sustain. You don't right. need to do all those runs to create a sound. Right. But there's a lot of middle voices and counter melodies that are in the piano part. And um, when Aaron, Alan uh, Periello was playing it, I had to tell him, like, Alan, I wrote in a lot of uh, orchestra, not orchestra things, but voices that I know you can't physically play. But I had them in the score just so they would be there waiting for me mm -hmm. um, when I decided to orchestrate. But come, coming up with the orchestration for this opera, has I had to do a lot of research because chamber operas are very different. There's a set um, ensemble, if you will. And with my style, um, I didn't want a string section because if you string section, that's not really an op a chamber opera to me. So I want single strings um, and like a wind quintet, uh, trumpet and trombone, uh, piano and percussion. Because a lot of, if you look, there's a waltz played on the piano, and it's supposed to be physically played on the piano because it happens, you know, in real time. Well, so it's, so it's, it's like source music. Uh, yes. Yeah, it's occurring downstairs in the hotel lobby. Right, the right. It's coming up through the window. Yeah. But then I had this cool idea that it's going to start like that, but then all of a sudden, you know, as they involved in their dance and fall more in love, the orchestra or the ensemble will come and then really blow that up a little bit, you know, because right. that's kind of happening in their minds. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, beautiful. It's a beautiful, uh, that's a beautiful transition. I, uh, I love uh, the idea. Yeah. So, um, you know, all these things, um, you know, with the orchestration, but that's a, that's probably going to take a year of my life to do that. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. It's like 300 and... 35 pages of piano music. Oh, yeah. my Lord. Wow. Because that, that was going to be my other... Th See, that's why composers get first billing, because while he does that, I'll be on the beach having a mojito. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Or several mojitos. <laughs> but that does kind of, that does uh, answer what was going to be my next question, and, and I had thought that, you know, if, if indeed you were doing the arrangement, if mm -hmm. you, because you had done this originally on piano, if at some point you were going to have to, like, literally... You know, re we approach certain musical phrases and decide, okay, no, this this isn't going to work here. Not for not not for a pit, not for a pit group. You know, I need to expand this or change this phrasing or anything like that. And that always happens when you're orchestrating. You know, instruments breathe a lot and resonate a lot different than the piano. So things get extended, things get cut, and you know. There's separate files, right? I have my piano vocal file, then I'm going to have to have a full score file, and then I'm going to have a part file for each individual instrument. So once you make one change, you have to change all three files. Wow. Mm, yeah. So they all have to match, you know? And um, So when you want to make big edits or, you know, you add an extra beat, I have to remember, I have to add it in the parts, I have to add it in the piano vocal score, and in the full score. You mean so, you're not writing all of this down on, on staff paper? Yeah, like Mozart. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I have a music program that I use. No, I'm, just, I'm just teasing you. <laughs> but you're, but not, I mean, you're not just like taking dictation out of your head? <laughs> <laughs> well, that uh, is, that's, a, that's a different process. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> so, and... Uh, you're working on trying to get Copper Queen or uh, what, what are you, Mourning for Adonis? Is that 
when Adonis calls. When Adonis calls. I'm sorry. Uh, so either one of those to get uh, a good premiere for that. Now, what what else are you working on, Clint? Are you composing anything currently, or anything I'm, that you right wish now, to I'm share? <laughs> Huh? Anything that you wish to share, let's put it that way. Well, yeah, right now I'm a composer in residence for a group in uh, San Francisco called Musica Marin. So uh, I use them as kind of my lab, my experimenting lab. They just did like an aria from uh, When Adonis Calls there. And I'm, we're working on so I'm going to be writing a piece for two violas, like a two viola sonata. So that's oh, wow. my next composition. So I'm going to be orchestrating Copper Queen and um, uh, writing this new two viola piece. I would love but to John hear that. John and I, we, we, we are, you know, we are keeping our ears open for the next topic or project that, you know, excites us both. Right. So th I would love to hear the viola piece whenever you finish that. Yeah, because Keith played I, viola I played the school. viola when I was in school, so... It's near and dear to my heart. <laughs> it's, it's a beautiful well, it's instrument. It'll be in uh, San Francisco, kind of close to Arizona. Yeah. So, uh, John, what you're you're, you're running all over the place because you're you, like a head with its chicken cut off. Yeah. So, uh, what are you doing these days? Oh, I just worked at Jack in the Box. Oh, just, oh, you just walked into Jack in the Box. <laughs> that so it? that's what you're doing right no, now. Work at <laughs> just work at a yeah, Jack. I'll tell you. No, I'm I'm a full time director choreographer, and uh, I. I'm on my fifth production this year and uh, just in the middle of, you know, two others that I'm working on. So the libretto writing thing is something I came into, you know, kind of uh, just as a means of directing more new work. So I figured I'll have to write it myself. And um, I have two composers that I currently work with, but I'm interested in meeting other people and finding topics. I mean, I definitely have a very kind of niche sensibility of what I like to write about. Um, but... Uh, like, I currently have another opera that I'm working on in Fort Worth right now at the Frontiers program with Christopher Weiss composing that's a farce about cell phones. I mean, it's just this 20-minute literal farce in a restaurant with people who won't get off their phones, which I think we can all relate to. Oh, and yeah. I'm working on expanding that as well. And, yeah, like Clint said, we're looking for um, a topic. We have a topic that we are very interested in, but we have to kind of figure out if the rights are available and some other things. But we'll be sure to keep you guys posted if that um, comes to fruition. We'll see. But, yeah, our top priority right now is to see, get Copper Queen on stage in front of the public and, um, you know, go from there. Yeah. So is there a, okay, so I, let's just, just go with this then. Um, uh, how can people learn more about what, the, I mean, obviously you just get shared with some of the stuff that you're working on, but if people want to learn more about like Copper Queen or if they want to know about, you know, what you guys are doing together individually, is there any social media, anything like that, that they can follow your progress on? Yeah. Uh, um, we're both on Facebook. We're both on Twitter. We each have our own websites, which I think, Clint, yours is your name.com, right? Yeah, my Twitter is just Clint Brizzoni. My Facebook is just Clint Brizzoni, and my website is clintbrizzoni.com. B-O-R-Z-O-N-I. Yeah. Best way with me is Facebook or my website, which is literally my name, johndelosantos.com, no spaces. Ah, All right. Okay, cool. So, well, this has been a wonderful, great conversation trip down the uh, what did we, you called it? Southwestern Gothic. Southwestern Gothic Lane. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> so, thank you for being on the show, John De Los Santos and Clint Borzoni, composer and librettist Thanks. of oh. Copper Queen. Yes, thank you. Welcome, curious listeners. This is Jackson Stewart, director of Beyond the Gates. Continue listening to the Two Gay Geeks podcast, if you dare. And that means it's time for the birthdays. Here are a few selected birthdays for May 8th through May 14th, 2017. May 8th. Oscar Hammerstein. Uh, wasn't his... I thought his first name was Rogers. So did I. Or, or was that his middle name? Um, uh, I got nothing. <laughs> also on May 8th, Don Rickles would have been 91 years old. Wow. Amazing. 
May 9th, Albert Finney, Rosario Dawson, Billy Joel, the Piano Man, and Howard Carter, born in 1873. Do you know who Howard Carter is? Mm, the name rings a he bell. He's an archaeologist. You say this every year. <laughs> I don't know. Oh. Howard Carter is the one that uh, su- that discovered the tomb of oh, Tutankhamun. Oh, that's right. Yes, I do remember that. Yes. Yeah, so, Howard, Howard Carter, 1873. May 10th. Bono. As in Sonny. No. No. Uh, it, one of those one-named singers, kind of like Beyonce. Oh, or Cher. Or Cher. As in Sonny's wife. There we go. Yeah. But this is a different Bono. No, but no. Th- yeah, this is the kind of Bono that I want to point my finger out and say, you too. <laughs> no. <laughs> no? <laughs> Moving right along. Oh, no, fine. Okay, whatever. <laughs> May 10th, Nancy Walker. She would <laughs> Oh yes, I I know who she is. <laughs> yes. Murder by death. Yes. Uh, among other among things. Among other things, <laughs> yes. yes. The most the, that's where One we, of my we favorite tend roles. To remember, yeah. Also on May 10th, David O. Selznick and Fred Astaire. Fred Astaire was born in 1899. Wow. Amazing, huh? May 11th, Salvador Dali. Wow, that you know that that's actually kind of coincidental. What's that? Well, Dolly, and we had a little meetup yesterday with some people that, or somebody who had something to do with a certain documentary. That, oh, yeah, you yeah. Know, oh, that's right, because they wanted Salvador Dolly. They wanted Dolly in, in as the emperor in, for, for uh, oh, Hodorowsky's right. Dune. Right, and we, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Also on my May 11th, Martha Graham. Martha Graham, Martha Graham, Graham, Martha, Graham Martha Graham. Martha Graham, yes, and Irving Berlin. May 12th, Burt Bacharach, Catherine Hepburn. Florence Nightingale and Dolly Madison, the inventor of those little cakes. Yes, she did. Yes. And also a former slicer and friend of the show, Tim Callender. May 13th, Beatrice Arthur, the star of the Star Wars holiday special. <laughs> holiday special. Yes. yes. That just makes people want to hang themselves every time it airs. Yes. Also on May 13th, Stevie Wonder, Peter Gabriel. George Lucas and Gabriel Fahrenheit was born in 17 or 1686. Oh, I thought that was like 168.6 degrees. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's Gabriel Fahrenheit 451. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay, you got me there. <laughs> May 14th, Robert Zemeckis, Sophia Coppola, Otto Klemperer, Della Cohen, who Hi, is a Della. friend of ours, and Mr. Jonathan Latt. Author and extraordinary, author extraordinaire and friend of ours. Friend of ours. Yeah, we had uh, dinner, had with, dinner with, him, uh, with Jonathan night. last yeah. night. Yeah, it was fun. That was a lot had of a fun. great time. Yeah. So that is it for the birthdays this time. Forget about whether Han shot first. He did. Is it true that Han Solo teamed up with a six-foot green rabbit? Did Darth Vader profess a devotion to the immortal gods of the Sith? And did Leia's unhealthy attraction to her brother grow for years? Ew! Hi, I'm voice actor Michael Corley, and I want to answer these questions and more on the Vox Box Star Wars comic book podcast. Each Vox Box episode covers classic Star Wars comics, starting with the original Marvel series in 1977 all the way to the present day. So tune in, have some fun, and may the Force be with you at VoxBoxPodcast.com. Go give a listen to our friend Michael Corley over at Voxbox Star Wars Podcast. Yeah, I was on. I did two episodes. I only heard one of them. I never yeah, heard the second one. I, I I'll have to go. Li- I'll have to go looking for it. Yeah, since we it was uh, the Star Wars Day here just the other day. Well, yeah, we you had, had George um, Lucas's yeah, um, birthday this week. Yeah, uh, it was uh, res- May the Fourth be with you, yeah, and then there was Revenge of the Fifth or Revenge, Revenge of the, the Sixth. Sixth. Yeah, there you go. Well, it, I think that one kind of they used that one twice. Yeah, you never know. All right, so. What time is it? About 2.13 in the afternoon. Yeah.
sounds like something by Daft Punk. And that's the end of that track. What? It just <laughs> cuts like that? Yep. Oh, how weird. Okay, starting off with the feedback. Uh, this goes back to our last episode, TJ Geeks episode 116. We got a nice little comment, or there's a comment, yes, from Chick Art Public Relations, and, sh and that is run by our good friend Patricia Chica. Yay, Patricia. Yeah, and she says, great interview with director Joe Ahern about B&B Film on the TG Squared Studios. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Patricia. Then we got a message from Arkel, good friend Arkel, and he writes, regarding the birthday segment, next time you get to Orson Welles, just mentioned one of his later, in fact, I think it was his last, films, the underappreciated F for Fake. I never heard of it, but now I have to go look at it. Thank you. Hopefully it's better. <laughs> that's, that's heresy for some people, uh, but not me. And he also then added, thanks for mentioning my little YouTube show. If you want to link people to it, start with episode zero. Sadly, I'm not big enough on YouTube to get a proper URL, so my YouTube channel still looks like it was made by a random password generator. Also, got a comment from Hamish Downey, and we're yeah. going to be talking a little bit about him a little yeah. bit later. And he writes, as always, thanks to Keith Leonard Ben Raginton for a continued support of for my manga. Um, how's that pronounced, you know? Mirai. Mirai, mm -hmm. worst birthday ever, yep. which is now number 78 on the bestsellers Yay. list, and we will be talking about that later. They give a really good shout-out once again in the latest podcast, which is an interview with one of the directors of Doctor Who. Check it out. What they do is absolutely golden. Well, thank you, Hamish. Yes, we thank like you. that. Yeah. And then uh, we had you put together a little press release regarding yeah. B and B. It was called "Dark and Humorous Thriller B and B" to be pre premiered in the U.S. And got another comment from uh, Chick, Art, Chick Art's Public Relations saying. TG, Ge TG Geeks slash TG Squared Studios just published the first details about outstanding suspense thriller B&B film by director Joe Ahern and producer Jane Chard. So, yeah, if you want to uh, read that press release, we will have yeah. the link for that in our show notes. Yep. And uh, we also had a review yeah. that we ran for the movie and got some comments there. Uh, first from Film Festival Doctor. Yeah. They write fantastic review. Oh, thanks. Well, thank you. And they got a comment on our website from somebody named Matty. And uh, Matty wrote, it looks good. But no shirtless slash nude slash sex scenes in a thriller? It would be a first. Well, there is uh, some uh, sort of. Well, the, there, yeah, there yeah. is one shirtless scene. The, well, yeah, there is a shirtless scene. Or, or two shirtless Several scenes. shirtless scenes, yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there, there's some very um, interesting activities going on in a park, and that's yeah, all I'm going to say. That's all I'll say. And then we also find, got another comment. This time it was directly from Patricia Chica. She uh, emailed us directly and wrote, Hi, Keith and Ben. I really love the interview. I learned more about Joe and his work, plus the anecdotes about Doctor Who. Hilarious. Thanks again for doing this wonderful interview with Joe. It was quite entertaining to listen to. Yeah. Well, thank we you, Patricia. Of, we had a lot of fun. Oh, it was, it was it was great, great. time. Yeah. yeah. It was a great time. He was he was a phenomenal interview. But you know, you have to give thanks to Patricia for you know bringing us together like that. Yeah, and and to Jane for setting that up. Absolutely. That yes. And then uh, we uh, ran an article saying that uh, could M Night Shyamalan's next movie be the Unbreakable Split? Huh. And for anybody who doesn't know, uh, just quickly. Yes, the sequel to uh, Split will also be a sequel to the Bruce Willis starring film Unbreakable. Yeah, that that's fun. Anyway, I uh, got another message from Arkel, and he writes, If he'd done this sometime before he did The Village, I'd be more excited about this. By which I mean I'd be excited at all, as opposed to giving approximately zero Fs. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Arkel, I'm about to say something you're going to really hate, but I liked The Village. So mm. there it is. And that's our feedback. Yeah. And we thank everybody for giving us your feedback. We really do appreciate it. If you have something to say to us, whether it's a, a comment about a show, comment about an article, comment about an uh, interview that we do, anything that we do, Facebook post, yada, 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 please let us know. We want to know. We, we, thrive on the feedback and we appreciate it when people tell us you know you're screwing it up well. stop or whatever you know give us feedback but please play nice 
You can do that on our Facebook page, TG Squared Studios, or you can also look up TG Geeks Webcast. You can comment on episodes and articles we publish. You can comment on our YouTube episodes. And you can also co uh, comment at tggeeks.com where you could receive a shout out on a future episode for any of those comments. You can also leave us a voicemail through uh, or voice message through Facebook, or you can call our listener line at 469 TG Geeks. That is 469 844 3357. Hi, this is Jonathan Latt, author of the pulp novel The Geek, and you are listening to the Two Gay Geeks podcast. And this this goes back to what we we're just talking a little bit about Hamish Down. You're going to talk about him and uh, his little graphic novel. Yeah. What what can you share with us about that? Well, he sent us a press release about uh, it's it was released oh, a couple of weeks ago right. on Amazon uh, in the English uh, translation, and I read it. It it, I, it my first manga. I've never read any other manga. Ma manga so. is a, it's definitely a genre all unto itself, and yeah. not just in terms of arc work, but also in terms, I think, storyline and, it, and it themes. It was fascinating. As I have commented a couple of times, it's, it's very Japanese, and you have to understand, I guess, the, the manga genre and Japanese culture and yeah. some, some other things. But it, it was... I enjoyed it. I mean, I'm in, interested to see where the story goes. Interesting. Uh, because it, it's just, it's an intro to, uh, it's her v worst birthday ever. And then it just, it just kinda, spirals out of control. Well, it spirals out of control and uh, it just kind of stops. So there's more coming. So well, that we that's that's that. normal for uh, you know yeah. uh, any any kind of you know, graphic novel slash comic book. I mean, it it just kind of you know especially when there's a continuing story, they're just going right. to kind of cut. So and it um it the press release says uh, a new foreign perspective on Japanese pretty cure manga, and takes the readers on a journey into Japan through foreign eyes. Now it's about a young Japanese Australian girl is about to have the worst birthday ever. But if she survives the day, she must make new friends and have a completely new life. Mirai is a, like a historical card captor Sakura, whatever that is, uh, mixed in with elements of Hiyo, Hayao Miyazaki, Miyazaki's Spirited Away, which we've seen. Yes. It has a strong environmental message, teaches kids about Japanese culture beyond the samurai, karate, and geisha. And it was illustrated by a, a Broadway scenic designer, uh, Kenichi Takahashi. Mm -hmm. And uh, then it just goes on to talk about uh, Hamish. And we'll have the, the full press release on the website. And We'll uh, have the link for that press release also exactly, in the show notes in the for this episode. Notes. Exactly. So check out the press release and check out the... Um, the manga, and we, we have, have the link for that. Have a widget on yeah. the, the right hand side. In fact, um, if you are looking at this on the website, you should be able to look right over to the right, and it's right there at the top. Yes, so but go go to uh, uh, yeah, just go to tggeeks.com, and that widget will be there on the right side of our page. Yep. So check it out. So uh, last week, a little. Um, a little movie kind of came out that I think we need to talk about. What? Guardians of the Galaxy oh, Volume that 2. that thing. Hardly little, my <laughs> word. This thing was just huge. like eye-poppingly big. It was huge. Of course, it helps that we, you know, it doesn't help. That, I mean, we saw it in IMAX in 3D. So, oh yeah, God. it was just gigantic. Yes. It was it was too much for IMAX. For I think it's IMAX too, yeah. I mean, if, I mean for me, for some people, maybe they can really appreciate that. Yeah. Um. I I think for for me, I I think the movie would be better served, uh, on, on, a, a, on a regular, screen. you know, seventy yeah. millimeter or something like that. Yeah. You know, just a regular movie screen, especially. Uh, there was a little, little tussle that happens towards the, uh, toward, toward you know, in the last third of the film, like around beginning of Act Three, that I think, or maybe 
actually towards the end of Act 3, that I think does not work well on IMAX and 3D. Yeah. I think it would be much better on the small screen. But that notwithstanding. It was a great film. I loved it. We have to see it again. What do you think of the music? Uh, the music was great. There were some things that I just I'd never heard yeah, before. Yeah, there were songs I'd never heard like, before. Uh, hello, I grew up in this era. <laughs> Why did I not hear this stuff? Well, some of this actually is like older. Really? Yeah, some of those songs I think from if I I was doing a little bit of reading on them, and some of them are a little bit older, but I mean, still very good. And I I now kind of I think you know we just watched Volume One the other yeah, night, yeah. but now I feel the need to have to watch it again. Because maybe I'm missing something with Volume 1, but with Volume 2, it looked, or I kind of got the feeling that the songs were actually telegraphing the story. Hmm. Yeah, well, the the Fleetwood Mac, yeah. Oh, the chain? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, so I, I need to ta take another look at that, but there were several moments. You know, yeah, like there, there's, a, there's a really great campfire bit in the film, and Yondu's, uh, you know, well, not Yondu's, but the Ravagers are coming up. And and you hear uh, Glenn Campbell's Southern Nights being played, yeah. <laughs> which I thought was just <laughs> delightful. Yeah. So, but yeah, I thought I okay story. What do you think of the story? Uh, I thought it was really good. I was, I was, um, yeah. I, I, without giving any spoilers away, there were was something that I was expecting, and and it did happen. But um, yeah, but it was a good story, and it was. A touching story, mm -hmm. and very, it, it very touching. Some buttons. Oh yeah, uh, a number of buttons. Yes, it did. So, I think, but I thought it was it was good, and it was good storytelling. Very good story storytelling. A absolutely. And uh, when we, when the movie was over, I met up with um, Lee Massey of uh, Finger Paint. Uh, they're they're the marketing company that allowed for the screening, and I she just wanted my my uh, comments, and I I said something to the effect of how they were able to, the studio and James Gunn were able to balance this big, epic, adventurous story with some very, uh, very, very intimate yeah. uh, character details. Yeah. And I mean, that, I mean, it's, j that, wow. The way they did that was amazing. Yeah, and uh, on Saturday, if you, if you don't follow James Gunn, it, it's worth at least going to his page and looking at the post that he posted on Saturday, probably about, oh, what was it, 12, 31 o'clock Pacific time, and why he made this movie. And, and the, he, he enjoys making movies for the joy of making movies and, and oh, he, he's, telling a he's story. He's a filmmaker's filmmaker. Yeah. There's no question he, about it. He loves it. to tell a, st a good story that has a message. So... Yeah. Uh, oh yes, it was a, a beautiful. It's a long post, post, but it was a beautiful post. It was. It was it very really, touching, yeah. and it it helped to further illustrate, I think, why Volume Two is the way that it is. And uh, there was an article that just came out earlier today, uh, as we're recording this. The movie has opened to one hundred and forty-five million dollars in it's the amazing. United States. That really I am amazing. so so happy to see that it it made that kind of money, and. Uh, it, this is on the Hollywood Reporter. For the fifth year in a row, a superhero entry for Marvel and Disney has kicked off the summer box office in high style. And this movie, of course, it, it was already released internationally before we got to see it here in the U.S. And so now it has made an early global total of $427.6 million. That's unbelievable. It is unfathomable. And this means this has pushed Marvel's net worth uh, Marvel Studios net worth at over eleven billion dollars in movie receipts. Yeah, and and I can only imagine that Disney has just got to be just you know they they're, they're just tickled pink at all the clink 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 in their little money coffers. Absolutely. So uh, yeah, that's Guardians. But hey, something you know there's there's a sort of another movie we want to talk about. Yeah, uh, we got to go to a little DVD signing or Blu-ray signing. Blu-ray signing, yeah. We for Beyond the Gates, yes, the movie by Jackson Stewart. We we did a review on it. We talked about it. We've talked about it a number of We've times. We've been talking about it for we, uh, oh about a eight. year almost. Well, <laughs> it's coming up on. It'll be a year in like you know August September. Right. It's, it's, we're about eight months now. We've been chatting about this film. Yeah, we interviewed Jackson Stewart, who was the director, and Stephen Scarlatta, who was um, he was the, the writer. Co writer and 
He also was the producer of Hodorowsky's Dune that we were talking about earlier. Mm-hmm. So they were both, they collaborated on this film, and we were at the Blu-ray release signing. Now, it was released on Tuesday, and we, we got a copy of it, and we watched it again. And that's the third time we've watched Third the time film. we've seen the movie. And the movie really it holds, holds up. up. It's great. It's a great film. It uh, features a number of people that are just fantastic and all of them the, there was only one person missing from chase uh, chase williamson was, didn't make it didn't make it to the signing but everybody else was there i mean director of photography barbara crampton was there just uh, Bree turner was there mm-hmm. um um Oh my gosh! I, uh, Graham Skipper. Graham Skipper was there. And Jackson um, and uh, uh, oh, uh, oh uh, was it Jason Merlin? Jesse Merlin. Just Jess, Jesse Merlin. Yes, yep. Jesse Merlin. And uh, it just uh, among other everybody people. who was yeah. attached to this movie was Virtually there. Virtually everybody that was attached to it. Yeah. Yeah. So it was great to talk to them about the film and to see them and to get them to sign the the DVD. Yeah, we have we have a Blu-ray absolutely Blu-ray wonderful. version that's that's now signed yeah, by them. So we have two copies now. We have so. two copies. <laughs> um one's going to go on the shelf. Yep, exactly. And uh we hope to be getting some interviews with some of these people yeah, very that very that soon. We're going to have a a widget on the side uh just probably below uh Hamish's uh, uh manga about uh, where you can Click on it and go directly to Amazon and order your own copy of Beyond the Gate. It is a great film. It is a great movie, you know. But one little one little takeaway from all of this, <laughs> I was amused. Uh, uh, while we were in line waiting for the signing, uh, they were they were opening bottles of bubbly, and uh, Barbara Crampton came up and handed uh, you and I both a a little little cup of champagne to toast the you know the, the release of the the film. Yeah, it was and fun. Uh, what amused me is that she's short. <laughs> Dag it, that that woman is short. Well, that's okay. She has nope. a big personality. Oh, she's got a huge personality. But it just it just makes me laugh when you when you uh, and th- this is so po- common with actors. You see them on the screen and they just look so tall. Yeah, and and she well the and the way she appears in the film too is uh, oh yeah. Well, it's, it, yeah, it's the way they film her. Look much, much bigger, larger than life, shall we say? Well, her character is larger than life. Yes. There's no doubt about that. But yeah, check out this film if you haven't seen it. Um, yeah, as Keith said, there'll be a widget to to buy this movie on our website. It is so worth it, especially if you love '70s, uh, you know, late '70s, early '80s horror. You know, which, when yep. when horror was meant to be fun. Yeah. You know, with you know dark humor and things like that, and and the movie just relies heavily on a lot of practical effects that are just unbelievably awesome. Yeah, this movie right. is a blast. So yeah, check it out. Yep. And as always, we have a few follow-up items. Uh, check out the calendar on the website for events, birthdays, cons, film festivals, etc. Send us a note; we'll be glad to put it up there. And as you know, we are huge supporters of independent creators, mm-hmm. such as Beyond the Gates, and. Hamish Downey with his manga, uh, both independent uh, creators, uh, and whether it's filmmakers, comic book artists, writers, uh, artists of any genre and, and any type, we are fond of supporting those independent creators because there is a huge amount of talent. There's a, a tremendous number of people that want to just create mm-hmm. you know, art. And if you see somebody that's doing a, a crowdfunding campaign, whether it's Indiegogo or GoFundMe or Kickstarter, please, please, please consider supporting them. Usually you can get in for as little as a dollar in mo- on a, most of the campaigns. You never know. You might be part of something big. Support independent creators. Oh, boy. Phoenix Comic Con. Around the corner. It is around the corner, May 25th through 28th, 2017. Memorial Day weekend. It is there three weeks are away. Still tickets available. I don't know if there's hotel rooms available. Last they, I read, there were still some. And they have announced their last media guest, and it is a big one. Dick, Dick Van, Dyke. Van Dyke. 
Yep. So, but as, to go to his panel, others, oh my gosh! To go yeah. into the Dick Van Dyke's panel, that's a special. Um, th that's a special purchase. It's a special ticketed. They will have a drawing for uh, free seats after they sell the the other tickets. So uh, check it out. Go to phoenixcomiccon.com and check out uh, if you want to go to the Dick Van Dyke panel and uh, get in the lottery for tickets. But it's not just him. There's a lot. Oh, of there's really, a bunch of lot people. of good oh guests that are going to be this be here this time. A I'm, bunch I'm of excited. Marvel people, uh, a bunch of uh, Marvel not only. Uh, movies, but Netflix, uh -huh. Marvel, as well as I mean, oh, oh my, and TV. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, it's just it is. It's a, a good lineup. Great lineup. I'm, this I'm year. excited, and some of these some of these guests I definitely want to be in their panel for. Doctor Who alum. Yeah. Uh, oh my gosh. Danny Trejo. <laughs> Danny Trejo. God, I'm, Machete. I'm, Machete. I I have to be in on that panel. <laughs> yeah. I got. I have to attend. You got to see that one, and uh, just. Go check it out, phoenixcomiccon.com. They also announced that FanFest is November 11th and 12th at the convention center. More info to come. Check it out when it's available. October, Arizona Opera presents OperaCon in conjunction with the performance of Hercules vs. the Vampires. It is a uh, hybrid opera music film thing. They've They've taken Hercules in the Underworld and set it to the dialogue to music, and they're going to have live singers and a pit orchestra and show the movie. So it's going to and be it, in And it is a trashy Mario Bava film. Yeah, and before that, uh, during the day on October, e what is it? I think 11th or something like, something that. like that. I can't remember. Don't have the d uh, we need to get the date in I there. I need to put the date in here in a script. Um, they're going to do opera cons at the Arizona Opera offices. And you can go down there and take a look at the costume shop and the wig makers and the props yeah. and the this big open and the house kind of a big event. open house thing. They'll have some demonstrations and oh my gosh, all kinds of things. So, so excited! Check it out. It's going to be fun. ArizonaOpera.org or AZOpera.org. AZ, that's it. Yes. Yep. Shout out to the Doctor Who Fan Cast Guide because they are continually taking our stories and republishing them. In fact, they I believe they actually republished uh, my my movie reviews that I've written in the last week or so. Oh, cool. And you can find the Fan Cast Guide by going to Twitter. Go to at Talking Who. They are Doctor Who Talking Who. In the same way, Arkel, who we had his uh, feedback uh, a little bit earlier in this episode, he posts the Arkle Times Post Dispatch News. And on Twitter, he is known as the Nazi Punching Scald. And his handle on Twitter is at Arkle. He also has on Tumblr something called the Incorrect Star Trek Voyager Quotes. And uh, here, here, here's a, a, a simple little one that. Um, <laughs> Uh, this, this is attributed to Captain Janeway. She says, I have to blow everything up. It's the only way to prove I'm not crazy. <laughs> you sounded almost just like her. I, I was working really hard at it, and it just, in my head it didn't sound right. <laughs> anyway. And of course he has a, and of course we did mention that he has a YouTube channel. We'll get the link for that in the show notes as well. Yeah. And then, special shout out again to Sci-Fi Obsession. They are on Facebook, and they, too, republish a lot of our stories. They can be found at facebook.com slash sci-fi of. That is S-C-I-F-I-O-B. And we want to give a shout-out always to The Lucky Show. The twins, Sasha and Dagmar, are absolutely wonderful. They do the greatest little short snippets of reviews on YouTube, and you can find them on Twitter as at Looky Show, and you can catch them on YouTube as the Looky Show. If you like old movies and kind of sort of campy reviews, check it out. It would slay me if they decided to do one of their episodes on us. Oh, that would be fabulous. Oh, that'd be that'd be insane. <sighs> now, special shout out to our favorite Facebook group, The Gay Geek for allowing us to post our episodes on their page. They have great people there. They have great content there. And, you know, what? something I love, 
great artwork there. Yeah. Really, really good artwork. Oh, yeah. I, I've got some. Ma- I ma- managed to get some really good iPhone wallpaper from people there. I mean, it's it's just such an awesome page. It is. And uh, special thanks to Jeremiah Reeves. He's their high imperial moderator. Yeah. For saying yes, you can share episodes here. You can find them by going to facebook.com slash groups slash the gay geek. And we want to remind you to occasionally click on our Amazon ads. We have widgets on the side of the page, most notably for uh, Hamish's manga, for Beyond the Gates, and for Jeannie Koch. And we, we have to give her a little shout out here. Yeah, because her latest, uh, the latest alien book, education. The latest and, alien book came out. Yep this week and it is great i finished it finally i'm i'm oh only gosh. on chapter 21 it right is now <laughs> incredible so uh it you don't have to buy anything but occasionally click on those ads it helps uh tell amazon that we're getting some traffic no you don't them. have to but we love it if you did but if you did decide to buy something from amazon click on one of our links and buy it through that we might actually eventually get money yeah we might actually get a check from them we've we've made a two whole dollars through our amazon ads but it's not enough so, for them to send to us yeah <laughs> and lastly please uh, lastly but not leastly but please lee rate us on itunes lee there we go and you're gonna have to start putting that in the script now you know yeah that. up next time not sure. Who absolutely no. We, because as we've seen, we've had interviews literally drop in our laps the day before we record. Exactly. So uh, stay tuned, and we'll be back next week. Okay, that should do it for this episode of TG Geeks Webcast. Be sure to check out the article for this webcast episode. We'll have several links on the page of stuff that we've talked about. And remember, you can comment on our Facebook page or our website, tggeeks.com, or you can leave us a voicemail at 469-TG-GEEKS. That is 469-844-3357. From TG Squared Studios, I am Keith Lane. Thanks for listening. I bid you peace. Cheers. Peace of pie.